On Saturday, July the 10th, 1976, a chemical reactor at the Igmaza chemical plant overheated, allowing for the unintended release of a cloud of material which settled over the small town of Seviso, Italy. The cloud contained toxic chemicals, and although no immediate effects were felt, this event would go on to become one of the worst industrial accidents of modern times. An accident exacerbated by the slow response of the owners of the factory and the local authorities. Located about 10 miles north of Milan, the small picturesque town of Seviso was a popular stopping off point for lorry drivers heading up into the Alps on the way to Switzerland. Seviso was famous for the tradition of furniture making, but the town also had another less well known industry, which was chemicals. Located on the outskirts of the small town was the Ikmeza chemical plant, owned by the Swiss industrial giant Hoffmann La Roche. The factory produced a number of chemical compounds used in fertilisers and herbicides, and it was here, in building 3 of the factory, that the accident would occur. At the time, Italian law prohibited the production of chemical compounds over the weekends, and so on the afternoon of Friday the 9th of July, when the factory closed for the weekend, the decision was made to leave an unfinished batch of chemicals in the mixing reactor in Building 3. The staff just assumed that the chemical stew would be, yeah, okay, until Monday morning, when they could start back on the process from where they left off. But, left unattended, without the mixer running, and with no automatic cooling process in place, an unexpected and completely unintended runaway reaction began to take place. By the Saturday afternoon, heat and pressure within the reactor had reached a critical level, and it caused the safety release valve to rupture. This safety valve vented the material outside to prevent an explosion, but there was no provision to contain the chemicals which were released. The result was that people in the area witnessed a reddish coloured cloud spewing from the vent on the factory roof. The cloud began to drift with the wind, covering the town and moving southwest towards Milan. Puzzled locals watched as the cloud drifted over, wafting down and settling over the town. But no alarm sounded and nobody panicked. Although the cloud was a bit smelly and it made a few people's eyes sting, nobody thought much of it. As one resident said, At that time, we didn't pay too much attention to it because there was always some cloud or some leak. And although there was a terrible smell, we didn't worry about it. We ate, we collected vegetables and flowers from the garden, as if nothing had happened. People soon got back to what they were doing. Children carried on playing. After all, it was a lovely summer afternoon. What nobody realised at the time was that an estimated 37,000 people had just been exposed to a massive dose of the poison dioxin. The runaway reaction within Building 3 had produced a small quantity of a chemical called 2378-tetrachlorodibenzodioxin, or TCDD for short. This compound was very similar to an ingredient of the toxic defoliant Agent Orange, which had been used extensively by the US Army during the Vietnam War. This is the same Agent Orange which was later blamed for the high incidence of cancers and illness amongst veterans of that war. Although the cloud contained an estimated 6 tonnes of material, only around a kilogram of TCDD escaped, but that's enough. The damage was done, and soon symptoms began to emerge. Over the next couple of days, people who were living close to the factory began to get sick with stomach problems. Small animals began to die. Poultry, rabbits, cats and birds were the first to be noticed. Plants began to wither and die, and many of the locals had vegetable plots around the factory, and all of these had been thoroughly contaminated with dioxin. About 36 hours after the accident, the management of the Ikmeza factory informed authorities that there had been an accidental release of chemicals which could possibly damage crops, but no mention of dioxin was made. The factory managers were still unsure of what had happened, and they had no idea really what chemicals had been released. As a precautionary measure, the next day locals were advised not to eat any locally grown produce or eat any poultry, and an emergency slaughter of some of the livestock began. 
The immediate danger was that people would be eating meat from contaminated animals, and over the next few months, an estimated 80,000 animals were slaughtered as a precaution. By day four, children and some adults were starting to develop skin burns and severe rashes which developed into chloracne, a truly horrible condition where the skin around the face, armpits and groin erupts into pus-filled boils and swollen and infected skin pores. This awful condition can last for years, even decades, and it's very difficult to treat. The doctors treating the first wave of sick children had no idea what had caused the chloracne, as officials from the Igmaza factory had still not confirmed that dioxin had been released. But by now, officials in the media were speculating that dioxin poisoning was to blame, and seeing how a kilogram of pure dioxin is enough to kill 50,000 people, panic began to set in. Eventually, after almost two weeks of exposure, Hickmazer officials admitted that in all likelihood dioxin had been released. However, the local officials still dithered, holding closed meetings and coming up with half-baked measures to try and reassure the local populace. In the end, it was down to senior chemists from Hoffman La Roche to convince them that evacuation was necessary, and finally, the order to evacuate was given. The toxic cloud had affected an area of roughly 18 square kilometres, containing a population of around 37,000 people. This area was split into three zones, A, B and R, depending on the concentration of dioxin which was to be found in the topsoil. In zone R, furthest from the site of the leak, farming activities were restricted due to trace elements of dioxin being found in the soil. In zone B, children and pregnant women were advised to leave due to the elevated risks. Zone A, a 110 hectare area which included most of the central part of Seviso, was completely evacuated and sealed off with a 12 foot high wire fence. No one was allowed in without special government permission, and no one was allowed to return home. The authorities were unsure of what to do and it was initially thought that Zone A would have to remain forever sealed off from the rest of Italy. However, a clean-up plan was put into effect to try and minimise the effects of the leak. This clean-up operation took over five years to complete. Two giant steel containers were erected in Zone A, and into these were dumped all the contaminated animal carcasses, the rubble from the demolished buildings, including the demolished Ikmaza factory itself, any household goods from Seviso, and hundreds of tonnes of contaminated topsoil. These two steel containers have been encased within giant concrete sarcophagi designed to hold the toxic waste inside for at least 300 years, by which time the levels of dioxin should be harmless. Finally, all of the contaminated protective clothing used by the cleanup crews was packed into 41 barrels the same type of barrels that are used to store nuclear waste, with the promise from Hoffman La Roche that this would be disposed of in a responsible manner. In cases like this it often seems that somehow nobody's ever held responsible, so was anyone ever held to account for the Seviso disaster? Well, the parent company Hoffman La Roche were forced to pay out millions of dollars in compensation Exactly how much is unsure, as most of the claims were settled out of court. Five Ikmaza employees were arrested and handed sentences between two and a half to five years, although many of these convictions were reduced or overturned on appeal. However, one man paid a very heavy price for his role in the disaster. In 1980, Paolo Paoletti, the director of production at the Ikmaza plant, was shot and killed by a member of the Italian Marxist group Prima Linea, who were protesting as what they saw as uncaring capitalism causing social and environmental damage. Today, Seviso seems to have put its dark past behind it. Zone A and the two giant sarcophagi are buried under metres of new soil and are now located within part of the Seviso Oak Forest Park. You can walk through there and have no idea that just a few metres below your feet are the remains of some of the most poisonous materials on earth. 
In terms of human costs, it's very difficult to accurately assess the damage done by the dioxin leak, as the long-term effects are practically impossible to trace. The immediate effects were the hospitalisation of hundreds of people suffering chemical burns and chloracne. The long-term effects of liver disease, cancer, respiratory illness are harder to trace due to many residents fleeing the area and never returning. Without doubt though, the Seviso disaster caused the premature deaths of many, many people. It's just that we'll never truly know how many. In part, the delay in seemingly inept response to the disaster was down to the fact that nobody was sure of just exactly what had been released. It was thought that the creation of TCDD was impossible in the chemical process that was used in the Igmaza plant, and if left to Italian officials alone, it's likely that no evacuation at all would have been undertaken. In a statement from La Roche, they declared, that the population of Seviso area was spared grave damages is due to the fact that we compelled the authorities to take seemingly harsh and unpopular measure of evacuating the population from the contaminated area. And so the saga was almost over, but not quite. Remember the promise to dispose of the 41 barrels of sealed waste responsibly? Well, that didn't go quite as planned. La Roche subcontracted the work to an independent contractor, Manus Manitalia, who agreed to dispose of the waste on the condition that La Roche didn't ask where it would be going. And in September 1982, the 41 barrels left the Seviso Zone A, bound for a non-disclosed location, supposedly to be incinerated. However, an investigative TV show had followed the route of the barrels to Saint Quentin in northern France, where the trail ran cold. The barrels were gone. It turned out that the subcontractors Manusman had themselves passed the waste on to a third party, again on the condition that they didn't want to know where it was going. And by now, nobody seemed to know where the barrels were or what had happened to them. Eventually, in May 1983, the barrels were discovered sitting unattended in an abandoned slaughterhouse in a small rural village in northern France. This public embarrassment forced La Roche to take responsibility and clean up the last of their mess. In 1985, the barrels were finally incinerated at a La Roche facility in Switzerland, a full nine years after the Igmaza dioxin lean at Seviso. It was the last step in the clean-up of the event which was nicknamed at the time, Italy's Hiroshima. <laughs>